Uh, hello, um, thank you for coming and for having me here. Thank you to everyone else on the panel, to Heather and Nicole who are online, um, and everyone else that's, that's been part of this project and um, you know, for the amazing welcome that we've just received as well. Um, this project has been uh, such an amazing thing to be a part of, not just you know for someone like myself, I guess, an early career researcher or someone that's more junior um, to, to be a part of a, a research project like this, um, especially, you know, with Nicole and Heather when they first reached out, um, but with the other panelists here as well, and Zoe in the audience too. Uh, and I should, you know, would be remiss not to mention my co-author and long-suffering PhD supervisor, Rashan, um, who's online as well. Uh, Rashan's a bit of an origin story for, for, for a lot of uh, my research and for my reason for picking this case as well, Kirk and Stuart. Um, I think I probably encountered it first in property law with Rashan, and um, I won't assume that you all know what Kirk and Stuart is. Uh, so it's an 1888 case from the Privy Council when we used to be able to go all the way up to the Privy Council. Um, and the short version of it is it's a bunch of rich white dudes fighting over a property grant um, and the government trying to make, take back 10 acres that was part of that grant originally in 1823. Um, they go through successive levels of the New South Wales Supreme Court all the way up to the Privy Council and there's an argument about um, basically that the government can't take those 10 acres back which they want to take back to build a public park for the working poor in the industrial areas of Alexandra and Waterloo in Sydney and um, the Privy Council basically saying that the rule against perpetuities or something that you know goes on forever doesn't apply to the Crown, they're special, they can, they can do what they want and that the Coopers weren't entitled um, to compensation. Something uh, that has always kind of fascinated me or, you know, I'm a bit obsessed with this case as well, so I can find a way to fit it into any course that I'm teaching. Um, and at the moment I'm teaching constitutional law and native title, so it kind of fits very well with both of those. Uh, but is the idea about legal foundations and how um, so much of, you know, what was just represented to all of us in the welcome to country today um, can be so easily ignored or, you know, have no uh, serious weight or relevance to the law of Australia and to our constitution. And um, so that's kind of been a constant theme that I've obsessed over <laughs> for a while with this case and I've approached it in a, a number of different ways uh, with Rashan and a couple of different research projects that we you know, were going to do but never did. And then uh, when Nicole reached out and said, you know, we're going to do this project, would you like to participate? Um, automatically it was Cooper and Stewart and yes, Rashan. Um, I'll say he'll do it, but I'll ask him that he'll do it with me as well. Um, and so it provided me you know, an opportunity to really explore that. And uh, I guess something that I was mentioning to um, colleagues here, something that my native Bible students are experiencing at the moment about the question why. So going through all these cases, talking about what happened, and they're still just kind of a little bit dumbfounded with surprise. And the question is, well, why and how? How does this happen? And um, I guess as my interest in the case has developed and in some other things I'm involved in, interested in, such as the order of saying from the heart and constitutional reform, and about what our foundations are as a society, especially our legal foundations, about how, um, you know, Marbo supposedly overturning what had happened in Cooper's Stewart. Sorry, I didn't add the other part of Cooper's Stewart, where to make the decision that they did, they had to assess how uh, the British common law, the law had come to the colony of New South Wales. And they said that it was practically a uh, uninhabited, uncivilised territory without laws or peoples, and that there was no law here. So the Crown, upon coming, assumed a, a radical title or complete title to Australia, and uh, it continues. And so the issue um, that comes up a lot in some of these debates about that question of why or why it's relevant. Um, a lot of us saw the symbolic kind of importance of Marbo that it overturned this idea of terra nullius and that terra nullius no longer applies. Um, but Marbo is still very much based on the idea of terra nullius, especially from an international law perspective. So it recognised a limited common law property right to native title, um, but it established terra nullius and the settlement myth as the foundation of the Australian state. And so 
along the way, um, you know, contrary to international law and practice in 1788, in 1888, and, and today, so Australia is really an outlier here compared to everyone else along the way. Um, and it raises, I guess, important questions to how we address that today. And I guess um, some of the themes that Narelle mentioned too about what's the good of law, <laughs> what does law actually do? And I think you know, we're all familiar in this space with you know, how law can be something that can so easily, you know, in Cooper and Stewart, sweepingly just take something away. Um, but then, you know, one legal judgment out of everything doesn't necessarily determine the whole history of a country either. And so uh, something Rashad and I have spoken about for years and discussed writing about and finally getting an opportunity to do it uh, was about the kind of social history of the story of how that actually happened. And so there's a there's a reading that Rashad used in Native Old that I still use today uh, by John Weaver, which was about the squatters and what the squatters did. And um, this was an opportunity to talk about land grants and free land grants and how that was done. And, um, the assumptions that we use. And throughout all of this, I've been concerned with this underlying dispossession, which can't authorise all of it. And that is the dispossession of First Nations and that dispossession, which still basically authorises the Australian state through Marbo and uh, even most recently in Love and the Commonwealth, determining whether or not we can be aliens and whether or not we can be deported. Um, the court affirming the Marbo decision with respect to sovereignty and law and the foundations of the Australian state. Interestingly though, um, most of the justices in the seven different judgments talk about uh, the political nature of that fact as well, and especially those in the minority pointing to the political realm as somewhere where that needs to be rectified if that's what the Australian people wish to do. And so that's one of the key themes, I guess, um, you know, my attitude to rules and laws and following them is probably representative that we didn't rewrite the judgment. Uh, we went with something different that was inspired a little bit by Nicole's own rewriting of the judgment in the Feminist Judgments Project, where she uh, wrote from the perspective of there having been a treaty and a specific court having established. And also uh, Irene Watson's approach in that project as well, which was that the law was not capable of hearing that and that she wouldn't rewrite that. And she wrote a commentary on that basis too. So it's about uh, trying to navigate some of those things and how it will come out and basically coming to this point that uh, the origin or foundation of the law or of our law in Australia, especially the Australian Constitution, um, is the political reality or the political nature of how it was established and how it happened. And that um, ultimately there is a limit here with regards to the law, especially a foundational law such as the Constitution that you know, kind of sits above all of this and that um, perhaps we should be, and obviously an option to put my activist hat on as well, right about the Ulrich statement is in my chapter, um, that we should be looking to those uh, legal reform options outside the strictly legal to be able to give uh, not only representation and recognition to the original laws, to the plurality of laws that exist here in Australia, um, but to be able to um, you know, rectify those areas of the past and provide a better foundation going forward for that negotiation between peoples and between wards. Um, so it was a bit of a, a nerd project for me in many ways to um, explore some of the deeper detail of the social history of what happened. But, um, you know, there's this fascinating aspect of it too, that's like a colonial drama. There's you know, some of the myths about Australia too, about our working class heritage or that you know, we're a classless society. Here's the working class people of Sydney and Waterloo competing against this family that end up, we were transported as convicts, end up as war barons within two generations, three generations. Um, they were gifted a lot of their land because of their patronage with Governor Lachlan Macquarie and um, Thomas Brisbane as well. And then by the time the Cooper and Stewart case comes up, um, so Daniel Cooper is living the high life back in the United Kingdom. Um, doing some jobs for Henry Parks and Charles Cowper, and he's collecting all of his rents from his free land that he's been granted back in the, um, Australia. And so talking about, you know, what that dispossession, what Justice Brennan spoke about in Marlborough, about the parcel by parcel of dispossession, that it wasn't the British landing here and saying, this is all terra nullius. You know, this, that's a retrospective justification to, to explain what happened. Um, trying to give some content and thickness to what actually happened. 
and also highlighting the fact that whilst all these arguments were going on, and still very much you know, a lot of the arguments that go on today about houses, property prices, um, you know, the position of or the, the nature of the class and inequality and wealth in Australia, and all of it still very much being underwritten by that original dispossession that remains unresolved. That's where uh, my chapter ends on recommending massively. If you haven't signed up for the Ulrich Statement, UlrichStatement.org. Um, <laughs> sign up, if you're on our email list, be an advocate and help us address that issue. Thank you.